as you turn to Titus 3, let me give you a little background of where we've been the last few weeks. So uh, the book of Titus is a letter <clears throat> that Paul is writing to Titus, who is located in the island of Crete. And so the island of Crete is a place where a lot of Greek mythology was birthed. In fact, Zeus was founded in that um, island. And so Crete is a group of people who weren't opposed to a god, but Titus is going to try to establish a church in a culture where they had many gods. In fact, they loved to create gods that kind of fed their own flesh and their own desires. And so we get this letter, a very short letter in the New Testament, where Paul is really equipping his disciple Titus to build a healthy church. And so he really lays out a blueprint of what it looks like to have a healthy church body. And so he's really going to press us as a church uh, in regards to spiritual maturity, but also really in regards to salvation. So he's going to start in chapter 1 by saying, Titus, as you build a church, look for um, godly men to lead it that are bearing fruits of really leading uh, spirit-led lives. And so we talked a lot about this illustration. And the reason we're doing this is Paul actually lays out this illustration in other passages of Scripture. But we, we talk about this, this idea of, and I love this idea, I bring this off, often to my messages, of self-worship, really being on the throne of your life. And so he's going to challenge this idea of, okay, Titus, you've got to look beyond what people say, and you've got to look at who's really on the throne of their life. And so he, he measures it by how the Spirit of God is leading them, for example, in their marriage and in, with their children. And so he says, examine, kind of peel off the onion layers and see the heart of the person. And the way you do that is to see the fruits of righteousness in their lives. And so he's challenging Titus to examine not what people say, but the fruit of their lives as evidence that they in fact stepped off their throne and that the Spirit is leading their life. And then he challenges us in chapter 2 and he says, okay, you also have to look at spiritual maturity. See, part of the problem in the church is you have people who are entertaining God but are not submissive to his lordship. And so he challenges us again with this idea of as they stepped off their throne, they will really mature to be others-centered rather than self-centered. So it makes sense. If you stop worshiping yourself and you've accepted Christ as your Savior, well, now the Spirit leads you. The same spirit that led Jesus. And who did Jesus come to, to serve? He served others. He was washing feet. He was coming alongside the poor, the hurt, the widows. And so Paul is going to challenge Titus. Hey, a sign of a spiritually mature church is they're no longer about themselves, but they're about others because they're being led by the Spirit. So I'll give an example. He's saying the people that are still coming, whether you're 10 or 20 or 50 or 70 years old, and it's still about them, I don't like this, this is my parking lot, I don't like the songs, then ultimately they're still on their throne. They just really like religion. He says, find the people who are other-centered, who recognize that the call of believers is to disciple others. And so he says, so look for older men who know God's word because they've submitted to it, who are also pouring into younger men because they recognize that they were saved from their own worship and their own kingdom, and now they are about building God's kingdom. And you do that by pouring into others, by pointing others towards Jesus, by discipling. So he says, find the older men and the older women who are discipling others, because that's a sign that they're walking in obedience with Christ. Why? Because that's what Jesus says to do. And so find the people who are actually modeling what Christ calls them to, and not just entertaining it with their mind. Not just coming on a Sunday morning and then going back to building their own kingdom, but are now purposely building gods. And he says, you're also going to see this in young people. So look for the young men and the young women who are not only being discipled, but are also discipling. Because they recognize as they stepped off their throne and they said yes to Jesus, they have to grow in spiritual maturity. They have to learn what the God's word says about relationships, about purpose, about meaning. And so find young people who are leaning into spiritually mature people and are being discipled because that's a sign, again, that they are spirit-led. And so here's what I'm going to ask you as we talk about the book of Titus and we end on chapter 3. It's a very clear question that I think Titus is going to ask all throughout the book, but especially in chapter 3. The question is simply this. Are you born again? Are you born again, church? That, that's the question. Now notice, when I say, are you born again, what I did not ask you is what denomination you are. What denomination you were raised. Whether you go to church or not. What you think about the Spirit. What you think about end times. Notice how I asked you a question, are you born again? That doesn't even mean that you can say, my family is Christian. Because that doesn't answer that question. 
Paul's going to make it very clear. For those in Christ Jesus, you have been regenerated. We're going to see this language in in chapter 3. The idea of, I once was led by my flesh and my own desires. I have stepped off my throne because Jesus has saved me. And now the Spirit of God leads my life. The old me has been put to death. I have been born again in the Spirit. If that's not you, one of the things that Paul does all throughout this passage in chapter 1, in chapter 2, in chapter 3, it says, question your salvation. For the sake of your soul and eternity, wrestle with this idea that if you have not experienced the Spirit of God and the transforming power in your life, you may not be saved. And that's not legalism. That's not saying, well, if you don't have the works, then you're not saved. Because Paul's very clear that we are going to do good works, but it's not because we want to be saved. It's because we are saved, and the Spirit of God leads us to desire righteous living. But the reality is, is if you think that you're saved, but you haven't experienced any transformation, let me say it like this. If God is still a genie in your life, and he's not Lord of your life, question your salvation. If you have not experienced death to the things you once were when you were on the throne. And by the way, Paul's going to say, I understand this person. I once was this person as well. The author of Titus once killed Christians on on the throne of religion. And so he says, this person questioned whether or not you're not just a religious person on, their, on the throne of your life, just entertaining God. I think sometimes we think we're saved, but we're still on the throne of our life. We just don't want to go to hell. And guys, I know this is challenging, but this is a good thing. It's an act of love. He's going to say to Titus, remember, he's going to say, sound doctrine is important. You are to challenge them that there isn't many ways to God, and there isn't chasing your feelings. And you are to do that, Titus, for the sake of their souls. Like, let them hate you for the sake of their eternity. Don't hide the gospel. Don't hide the need for the Savior from people. Don't tickle their ears and destroy their soul. And so the question today is, are you born again? Have you truly given your life to Jesus? This is the question that we're going to wrestle with. And it's a good question. I don't know your heart. Paul doesn't know your heart. But he's going to poke at your heart and say, who actually is leading your heart? Not who you say, but who are actually leading your life. And that is going to be a sign of whether or not you've truly given your life to Jesus or you've just entertained religiosity. And so with all that being said, here's what he does in chapter 3. He starts, now here's why I love Paul's writing. It's very easy to teach. Um, Paul's writing is a compare and contrasting style. That's kind of why I laid out this comparison of somebody who's on the throne of their life who, though they could have religious activities, they are the source of decision-making, of meaning, a purpose of morality. And then there is somebody who has died to self, and the Spirit of God, Jesus, is on the throne of their life. And so the difference is, Lord, give me something, I want something, genie God, to you are Lord, guide me, direct me, I submit to your leadership. And so he's going to compare and contrast these two people, and he's going to remind the church that they were once both people. And, and so knowing that, to say, here's how you measure whether somebody's still on their throne or whether Jesus is on their throne. And so watch what he does in chapter 3, verse 1. Remind them, okay, he's coming over here. Remind them to be submissive to the rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and show perfect courtesy to all people. He's going to start by saying this, remind them, now that you are in Christ, the Spirit of God is going to cause you to be other-centered. Why? Because Jesus was. And so as you mature in faith, you are to have good works. Why? Because Jesus calls you to be with the broken, to be with the hurt, to be with the sick. And so you are going to stop running after hobbies, and you're going to start running after the broken with the gospel of Jesus Christ, because you realize that's the hope. And so he says, you are going to have good works because you're going to line up with the Spirit towards the things that God cares about. Like, I'll show you, I'll give you an example. The reason I know that the Western church is immature is because the church spends way too much time on theology and way less time on mission. 
And I can explain to you how that happened. Early on, the church was all around the broken. They fed the sick. They fed the poor. They clothed the poor. They were in hospitals. They were in schools. They were around people, and they were being the church. And then for whatever reason, the church said, we're going to give that to the government. You feed the poor. You clothe the sick. And then we stepped back, and we weren't doing those things anymore. So what did we start to do? We started to debate theology. And guys, if you want to know the origin of denominations, that's it. The church took its eyes off of the work of Christ, and they started debating the theology. And then we had denominations. All the while, we stopped being the church, and we started to talk internally about theology, rather than showing the fruits of righteousness. And so here's the problem. The government can feed people, but they can't give them the gospel. The church is called to feed, to shelter, so that we minister to the flesh and feed the soul with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul says the church that is mature is not only saved and sanctified, but is missional minded not only to clothe the, the, the um, homeless and feed the poor and be with the prisoner in the orphanage, because that's where God is, but we're also to inject the gospel of hope into those worlds. And so he's saying this is the sign of spiritual mature people, Titus, is that they have died to their own self-interest, and now they are passionate about the things that Jesus is passionate about. They are where Jesus were. They were doing the things that Jesus is doing. And so look what he does here. I love this. He goes back to the flesh. Look what he says in verse 3. For we ourselves were once foolish. We were disobedient. We were led astray. Slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our day in malice, envy, hatred by others, and hating one another. Okay, tell me you know what it looks like to worship yourself without telling me you know what it looks like to worship yourself. Like, this is so powerful. He's like, remember when we were on the throne of our life? Remember before Jesus came, before we had a Savior, we were a people who would Develop hatred, not only towards others, but hatred towards ourselves. This is what Paul just says here. Okay, let me explain this, because it makes perfect sense. Okay, when you are on the throne of your life, you have to, you have to blame other people for your misery. When you're miserable, or when your soul is starving, you have to blame others because you're on the throne. You can't look at your own heart. You have to say, it's because my parents raised me wrong. It's because the culture's against me. It's because those judgmental Christians. It's because whatever. But you got a point because they have to be the problem because you're on your throne. And what Paul's pointing out here is he remembers when he was a guy who used religion as a platform for his own self-righteousness to the point where he killed Christians. See, the problem is even religion can posture towards your own self-worship if you're not careful. You could be religious and lost. And so he's saying, here's the problem. Not only were we having to blame others, but we hated ourselves. See, the problem when you worship yourself is you make a horrible God and eventually you got to deal with that reality or you become hate, hatred towards yourself and it extends towards those around you. You're angry at your spouse because you have an angry heart and you don't want to heal from that heart because you still want to be on your throne. See, the problem is, is we point towards the problem even though that's not the problem. Paul says, without a savior, the only hope we have is us. You remember how miserable that was? Like, I had this conversation with this atheist woman the other day, and she was very anti-Christianity. In fact, in the conversation, she didn't know I was a Christian, and she didn't know I was a pastor. <laughs> she did, eventually, but not right away. And I was just listening to her, and the whole posture was this. It was, the problem with our universe is religious people. It's Christianity. That's the problem the Christians. And if they would just, and she'd start pointing out all the things. And I was like, I agree with you. I did. Most of the stuff I agree with. Like, like man, that's just, uh, religious people are hypocrites. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's true. That's good. And she's like, and, they, and they're just so judgmental. I'm like, yeah, totally are. <laughs> like, I agree. I was like, non-Christians are too. I was like, people are horrible. And she's like, so the problem is, if, if we would just not have religion, then the world would be okay. And I said, here's the question I have for you. Can you give me a civilization in all of human history that was good? 
on your own standard. And she's like, no, but, but we can if we just got rid of the Christians. I said, okay, so here's the problem. I agree with you on the idea that when you look around you, whether it's religious people or not, you will find that human beings are sinful and broken and greedy. And absolutely, people have taken religiosity and have still be, been on their throne, but used it to create a hatred and bitterness and anger and hypocrisy. That's all true. But here's the problem, is the same people you are blaming without Jesus are the same people that brings the hope to you. Like without God, the people that are the problem somehow have to also be the solution. See, this is the difference with the gospel, is the gospel understands that we are all broken and that we make horrible gods and that our Savior came. So our hope isn't in people. In fact, we can step off our throne because we no longer have to be the Lord of our life. Now we have a God who's rescued us, a Savior that has come despite us. That's the beauty of the gospel. And so the problem is, she was pointing out the broken sinfulness of man, but she forgot or she missed the fact that people of God don't celebrate us, we celebrate a Savior of us. You see, what she actually is desperate for is somebody to let her step off her own throne, because she's miserable. And that's what Paul's saying here. Paul's saying, do you remember when you were the one that had to fix your problems even though you hated yourself? Like, here's the problem with the world and the narrative of self-worship. And you're like, we don't worship ourselves. We absolutely are being promoted this idea that, that you are the solution to your problem. Here's the problem with that. If you're teaching people that you are the solution, and, Dave, and Paul's going to remind us, what about people who hate themselves? What about people who have brought destruction to others and because of that they start to see the devastation of their own lordship and they start to feel so miserable because of the consequences of them being on the throne. They start to hate themselves even more. Where's the hope for that person if, if the world says you're your hope? So Paul's saying, do you remember when we did not have Jesus? Do you remember when we had to stay on our throne and we had to fix things? He's like, think about how destructive and hateful that was. Guys, I don't know about you, but this is a beautiful passage because what it says is spiritual maturity is not works. Spiritual maturity comes with surrender. How beautiful is that? Because then we offer you as a church through the gospel. We don't offer you a do good works and then you're saved. It is surrender, confess, step off, and let the Spirit of God transform you. How powerful is that to say, th this is what this says to people. You don't have to be on your throne anymore. Isn't it exhausting? And I recognize that, guys, deep in my heart. Man, I can tell you, there is times where I played the game of looking like a Christian, and my heart was far from Christ. And that is a miserable place to be because you're filled with hypocrisy you're filled with fear thinking that I had to outside pretend that I submitted but not actually submit and somehow God's going to be blinded by that even though Paul's reminded God is interested in your heart and who actually is your Lord how comforting that now watch what he does I love how he compares and contrasts look at verse 4 but when the goodness of of the loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared. Okay, who saved us, church? He saves us. Not because of our works done in the righteousness, but according to whose mercy? His own mercy. By the washing, and here it is, the regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. When he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Okay, we cannot miss this. How then, how then can we step off our throne? Paul says it is Jesus coming down. It is his grace, his mercy, but pay attention. It is also him who draws your heart away from you. <laughs> 
who gives you a softened heart to receive the good news of Jesus. And not only that, but as he does, he softens your heart to the need of the gospel. And then he brings the Holy Spirit into you to bring about his peace and his joy and then his sanctification. So what did Paul just say? All of this is by the grace and mercy of God. Okay, why is that significant? Because for somebody who says that they can lose their salvation, this is a challenging verse for you. But for somebody who thinks that they're also saved at 12 years old because they said a prayer at a Bible camp, this is also a challenging verse for you. Because here's what this says. You can't save yourself. So how can you lose that which you can't gain apart from his grace and mercy? You following me? It is him who draws us. So then the, the reality is, is as he saves, he seals. As he seals, he transforms. Which means God doesn't have a personality disorder. If that's not your testimony, you should be concerned. Because the reality is, is we make less of the power of God when we think salvation is just us intellectually acknowledging something. And so absolutely, if your testimony is, man, I was 12 years old at a Bible camp, and my friend went up and said a prayer, and then I went up and said a prayer, but then nothing in my life has ever changed. Absolutely, I challenge your salvation in love. To say, maybe you never surrendered. There is a God who is far deeper. He's not a distant God. He's not a God of the theoretically exists and maybe you'll meet him in heaven. He is an intimate, transforming, loving God. And so if that's you, I, I don't know your heart, but here's what I would say. If that's honestly you, man, get on your knees and say, Lord, I give you all in which I, just, I didn't give you prior. Lord, I want to have a relationship with you. Lord, I confess everything and I surrender everything. I want to know you, Lord. I want to follow you. Lord, you are my savior. You are to position him, pleading for him to save you. Lord, I want to give you all of it. I'm stepping off my throne. All of the pretending, all of the lies, all of the fake. I give you all of those things because I want a real God and a real relationship and I surrender all. You ought to seek him with your heart. And I can't do that for you. Your parents can't do that for you. But Paul says, man, you are to see those who have sought the Lord with their heart and you see the spirit of God and the fruits of that leading in their life. And guys, what a passage for the gospel of grace. Because if the gospel is this, which it is the gospel, Paul is very clearly given us the picture of the gospel. If we stay on the gospel, man, we, there's no room for pride in that. Like where is, where is, where is legalism if we truly understand the gospel? Because the gospel here is, we were all drowning in self-worship, and we were saved by Jesus, every one of us. And if you weren't saved by Jesus, if you didn't cling on to the cross, you're still drowning. Doesn't matter what denomination you're in. Doesn't matter if you go to church, if you haven't clung to the Savior, if you haven't given your life to the Savior, if you haven't actually stepped off your throne, you're just a religious person still drowning. Because there's a very loving God who is wanting to be not only your Savior, but your Lord. But he doesn't force his love. But see, this, this gives us more than religious systems. This gives us more than religious hypocrisy. This gives us a living God who can transform us. Good news. Look what he says in verse 8. The saying is trustworthy. And I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. These are trustworthy. Guys, this is why I have a deep conviction. The gospel is always going to be loud here. The gospel. Because when the gospel fails to be loud, everything else becomes loud. Like practically, here, here's what I mean. 
This is why I, I stayed gospel in the midst of the political tension of our world. Why? Because without Jesus, none of it matters. Doesn't matter without Jesus. I'll prove it to you. Without Jesus, none of the theology matters anyway. So like, if you are somebody who says, stop preaching the gospel, I wanna, I wanna hear more stuff. Okay, you're an end times theology. Okay, you're pre-millennial, you're amillennial, you're post-millennial. But if you don't know Jesus, you're still going to hell. You can have great theology and go to hell. And so if we're not reminded of the gospel, this is why he says this is trustworthy. This is what you anchor the church on because the gospel reminds us that we're all in need of a savior. So it puts us at the same level of humility. The gospel also reminds us that it's not our works, it's his works, which keeps us in a posture of worship. The gospel also reminds us of our mission, which is to make disciples, which keeps us from thinking about ourselves. It is a repositioning as we meditate on the gospel towards the things that matter. And it is an indifference towards the things that don't. And so he's saying, build your church around the transforming power of the gospel. Measure your church by not what they say, but who is on the throne of their life. And do not let them think that religious systems save. Give them Jesus over and over again until finally they step off because you want them to know a living God. You want them to know the transforming power of the Spirit. And we make no apologies on that. Some of you, you're offended when I say you might not be saved. Don't be offended. I love you. If you're not saved, that is an act of love to challenge that. Think about it. Paul is not doing this in a place of self-worship. He just told you he stepped off his throne. He's dead to that person that used to kill Christians. He's challenging Titus to say, speak to their heart. Challenge their heart. Guys, I won't have to encourage you to read your Bible, encourage you to serve, encourage you to pray if you step off your throne. I won't have to. But until we do, I'm going to keep on reminding you. I'll give, I'll, I'll give you an example. Why, why it's hard for you to pray is most often because you're on the throne of your life. Think with me. So why would you ask somebody else for advice when you go to yourself? You'll be indifferent towards prayer because you don't need to know what your Lord says. You're Lord. Why are you going to read the Bible when you're Lord of your life? Why would you care what somebody else says? It's your decision. You see, the hunger for prayer, the hunger for righteousness, the hunger for the word comes when there's somebody else leading your life. And then if it is, I don't have to encourage you to pray. You're going to be praying because you're going to need to know what your Lord says. You're going to be in your word because you want to know what your Lord wants you to do. See, what if the problem is you haven't stepped off yet? You see, here's what Paul does to end. I love this. Look at verse 9. But avoid foolishness, controversies, genealogies, divisions, decisions, and quarrels about the law. For they are unprofitable in what, church? Worthless. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. Knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. What is Paul doing here? He's saying, hey, listen, don't build your church on people who want to use the church to build their own kingdom. And you will see this by how they talk and what they talk about. He says, don't spend a lot of time catering towards spiritual children. Call them to grow up and get yourself around spiritual and mature people who are going to have conversations about kingdom about discipleship, about the mission that they were rescued into. Find yourself around people who are born again, and they're not going to be talking a lot about their flesh. You see, the reality is, is we will always battle the flesh. We will always battle it until we get home to the glory. We will. We will. And so some of the questions that came out of this morning, just through some of the conversations I was having in the lobby, is how do you know if it's like self-esteem or self-worship? That's a great question. 
Because are we saying, hey, Christians should, should hate themselves? By no means. In fact, the more you step off your throne and the more you receive what God says about you, I would argue the more you actually start to love yourself. Because you will realize that you are a child of God, that you have been made in his image, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, and that you have a kingdom purpose and that you're an eternal being. I would argue the less you think about yourself and the more you adopt what he says about you, the stronger your self-identity will become. It's only when you worship yourself that you'll destroy yourself. You see, the reality is, is as a believer, we are humble enough to always realize we need a Savior and that we're broken, and yet we're dependent enough to always go to the Spirit of God to lead us out of that flesh, to lead us out of those things. So, so here's how that looks. Christ followers, those who are born again, when you have tension in your marriage, you don't point to your spouse, you point to your heart and you say, God, fix it. When you have tension with your coworkers, you don't point to your coworkers, you point to your heart and say, God, sanctify it, transform it. When you're angry toward your family, you don't point to your family, man, you point to your heart and say, Father, replace this angry heart with one of love and patience. You see, a believer is not gonna be free from flesh, but now we have power over flesh because the spirit of God is leading us. Lord, you need to prune me. You need to sanctify me. You need to get rid of my old and put on the new. This is what a believer is. They are born again. Born of the Spirit of God. He's who leads you. He's who directs you. Again, we, we move from genie to Lord. Now notice something that he does here. Look at verse 12. I'm not going to read all of this, but, but we were just talking about Titus. And, and he's challenging He's, Paul's challenging Titus to say, okay, fight for health. Establish a healthy church, which means you've got to be courageous. You've got to say the gospel. You've got to be controversial in a world that wants to worship themselves. But you do that because you love them. And he says, you are to build out godly people to lead it. You are to focus on discipleship. And so he's giving Titus this huge burden to steward the church. But notice in verse 12, he says, I'm going to send people to help you. So, so what he's doing here is saying this. In all of this, you do not have to do it alone. That's why the church is important. The church is not just gathering. We are the church, especially as we go. The reason the gathering is so important is because we're called to fight each other's flesh and to remind each other of the Spirit of God. We are to point each other towards surrender, confession, and deep dependency on the Lord. We are to encourage each other in that direction. And so Titus isn't going to do it alone. He's going to have other brothers and sisters come and bear the burden of health and mission. And guys, that's what you are here. The church is not staff pastors and observers. We are the church. In fact, Ephesians 4 says we are to equip you for the works that God has called you to. That the mission of this church is the mission that God has given each one of you and we want to help you to discover it. And it starts by you stepping off your throne. Because when you do, God will start to reveal what he's called you to, which is a far greater purpose than a job, retirement, and death. So, so I'm just going to plead with you to end this. The question of, are you born again? For some of you, it should convict you. It should convict you to a place where you need to pursue that question. You need to let your heart wrestle with, man, ha have I seen this regeneration? Have I seen the renewal of my life through the Holy Spirit? If not, man, prayer, confession, and, and a deep belief in Jesus is the posturing you take. I'm done pretending. I'm done just putting religion around my throne, thinking that that's somehow what God wants for me. And for some of you who are born again, and you know the transforming power of the Spirit, but you've wondered, you've, you've overcome your, your dependency on the Spirit with your longing to be in your flesh, I would just remind you, you don't have to chase after the things of this world anymore. You have been rescued from it. You don't have to approach your problems the same way your neighbor has. You have a spirit, an intercessor, 
that you can go to, that you can lean on, that you can depend on. And so for believers who are born again, lean into the Spirit. Let Him take over those areas that you're still trying to fight. And then bear a testimony of that transforming power as Paul shares with us. And so I'm going to invite the band up and I'm going to pray for us. And I'm going to ask you, if you aren't born again, if you don't know what it looks like to, to have the Spirit of God transform you, maybe some of you, you just kind of grew up in a religious system where you were taught God, but man, you don't have a relationship with this living God, I'm going to invite you to do that this morning. And it comes from confessing your need for a Savior. By saying, Jesus, I believe that you died for my sins. And I give you everything. I step off the throne of my life. And Lord, I'm asking you to lead my life. Scripture says, as you do so, and your heart is sincere in that, the Spirit of God will come into you and will make you a new creation. And yes, you will lose things that you once loved. You will lose friendships that you created when you were on the throne of your life. But I promise you, you will get deeper ones. You will lose past treasures that you once needed but you will get greater ones. You will absolutely wrestle with the comforts of the flesh that you have to die to, but I promise you, in the spirit brings way more peace and joy than the flesh ever was. So, so simply put, it is worth it. And not only that, but you get a savior who has overcome this world. So to live in right relationship with God through the blood of Jesus, to live in deep dependency on the Spirit of God brings heaven to the now. So then you get God now in the midst of the broken world and you get God forever. So the hope you get in stepping off your throne is never going to be taken from you. It is sealed by the blood of Jesus. And so this is why we can worship. We don't worship in hope that maybe one day God will forgive us. We worship because he has forgiven us. Because he has sealed our salvation. In the midst of all the failures and all the times we're going to still lean into our flesh, he has overcome the flesh. Guys, when Jesus was on the cross and he turns to that thief, and all the thief brought was a life of self-worship, a life of destruction, a life of not doing anything God wanted him to do. But he turned to the Lord, and with his heart, he sincerely said, remember me. And in that moment, he was sealed. So nothing about you stepping off your cross earns salvation. It just frees you to do it. How beautiful is that? And for those who are in Christ Jesus, man, you are sealed. So because of that, be sanctified. Walk out the promises that come. Lord, we love you, and I thank you for this room. I pray that your spirit would soften the hearts it needs to soften. Father, we are reminded that you are the one who draws us. So Father, draw those hearts in this room towards you. The ones that are far from you, Lord, I pray, I pray you bring them near. And the ones that have been walking with you, Lord, I pray for a greater dependency on the Holy Spirit in their lives. Father, I pray over our marriages that they would be more dependent on the Spirit. Our families, our jobs, Lord, I pray that we would be Spirit-led because we are saved. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for the grace extended to us.